webcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today we are joined by Andrew Kruig with his uh, webinar, Patterns of Automation Greatness. We have a webinar next month. It is with Elizabeth Hock and she will be presenting I Am Groot Learning Agile Testing. So you can sign up for that webinar over on our Huddle site. We've also announced a webinar with our program chair, Rickard. He will explain the conference program. Um, this webinar isn't just for those attending the conference. He will, he will explore emerging trends and how a conference program can be put together. If you would like to ask Andrew questions at any time during this presentation, please do in the question box on the right hand side of your screen and I will allocate 10 to 15 minutes at the very end of Andrew's presentation to ask him those questions. So I will make Andrew admin there. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Great, I'm thank you. Sure. Yep, I to make sure I was going to pick the right window there. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you for joining us, or joining me, Eurostar, whatever, um, on this talk on uh, patterns or automation greatness. Um, 
one of the first things I'm actually going to uh, do is if <clears throat> there we go. Um, I have a uh, little cheat sheet on how you can write less code because um, it's way too much content within this presentation. Uh, so if you go to this uh, Bitly link, which I'll show again uh, later at the end of the my presentation, uh, you can go there, sign up, and receive that in your inboxes on Monday. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> as my Twitter handle suggests, I am the lazy coder at lazycoder.io. I've also been an automation engineer for my entire career. I'm part of the selection committee for Selenium Conf, and I run the getting started with Selenium at the Selenium Conference, along with a principal consultant at Gingham Consulting. Uh, so to start things off, uh, I'm going to give you a little story about how uh, my first job sort of uh, came to be <clears throat> with automation. And by the end of it, uh, my daily tasks that I had to do um, was attend stand-up number one, and then followed by stand-up number two, three, consult with another team, automate uh, for another team, and then consult with, a, with another team. And <clears throat> I managed to do all that without having like any team at all. And you're probably wondering like, how could I possibly have done that if I was constantly contributing to all these different teams. And I did that because I managed to carve out about one hour a day to continually improving my own development skills so I can make my life easier when I had a chance to actually automate code. So, or automate the uh, products. <clears throat> um, and my test suites got so stable and so uh, solid that um, my my quote unquote sweat time was when the uh, CIO of the company stormed into my cubicle and was demanding that I make sure everything is correct on our sites um, because he was certain that there was something wrong with it. And I was 100% confident that every all of my tests, all of my reports, all of my dashboards, all of my metrics is saying everything is working as expected. So I. I'm not concerned. It's nothing with my site. It's something else entirely. And it ended up was a department managed to get hit by a virus, um, completely unrelated to me in a different country. So, um, but because of all the things I did, I managed to never really worry about anything because I knew my uh, code, my test space was solid and always performed under the correct conditions. So to go through this, uh, I'm going to go through like how you evolve your framework. And uh, when you first start out with Selenium, <clears throat> your first test is generally get this URL, click this thing, and then type in something. Generally, the login page of your site. And then you go and you write a second test, and you type it in get and then you type and click and then you're like nope I am never going to do this again because this is a lot of boilerplate code that you have to write down every single time that you want to interact with your site and as soon as one test breaks like the login decides to change or the developers modify it <clears throat> you end up having to touch all of your tests again and that's how you get really bad unmaintainable code. Uh, so obviously the first thing you learn is uh, page objects. And the page objects, once you finally get them, once you wrap your head around the concept and you actually start doing it, you get a um, whole lot more maintainable code. And you get that uh, maintainable code because <clears throat> You're, we get to reuse, you get to reuse stuff you've already written and then you get to maintain it a whole lot easier. Um, and this came, uh, this aspect for me came fairly easily because I actually come from a web design background and all web developers reuse components over and over again. They make it very easy for themselves to make reusable components all day long. And our job as automation engineers is to interact with the web route 
interact with the website they produce. So if they're using reusable components, uh, we should as well. <clears throat> so, um, and of course, when products are in development, uh, they can have as much time as they want to get things right. However, once it gets to the QA side, there's always the question of what took you so long um, to actually like come up, write up tests and write up tests to start testing our site and making sure it all works and everything. And it's generally because they've had months to do it and we might not have as much time. Um, and what developers love to do actually is to uh, refactor their code. Um, it gives them a second chance to do it all over again, um, knowing what they know from the first time around. So um, generally like the first method that they make uh, might not be the prettiest, but it will be functioning. But when they get to refactor it, they get to pull apart all the components and make it a whole lot easier to use. And refactoring for automation engineers uh, it's very similar as well, because there's going to be certain time, certain flows that we use to interact with the components upon the uh, system under test. And the first question you generally come up with, well, how do I figure out that, figure out what do I want to refactor, what do I want to pull apart, is uh, when you're going through your code, if you remember seeing this code before, or you're thinking about copying and pasting, like a method or a group of lines, um, and you're like, oh, hey, I saw that. Um, that's those are the candidates you're going to want to start pulling out, and you can reuse them in different classes. Which then, of course, is like, okay, how do I use these methods in different classes easily? <clears throat> and that's done through abstraction. Um, and when you get to do when you get to finally do good abstractions um it's typically based around uh similar objects so there will be like a base page object and there'll be a base test that all your uh page objects inherit from the base page object and then the tests all inherit from the base test and then like the base test you would have uh specifically for selenium you'll have like the before the test uh, create the new web browser, open up the new web browser instance, and then navigate to your site uh, before you even start what's in the actual test code. And <clears throat> implementing good extraction will get you to dry code. And dry means, uh, well, dry pattern, I guess, uh, is uh, don't repeat yourself. And once you start doing a whole lot of this code, um, you're essentially uh, version two of the automation engineer because you're now implementing a lot of good solid practices from development to make your own code base clean, simple, easy to use. And one of the key factors that I've seen that somehow eludes a lot of automation engineers, they don't fully under realize it or understand it is that um, you're all, the, the general title for automation engineer is software development engineer in test. And you're, you're a developer, you're a developer in test. So you should always be looking on how to constantly improve your development skills and make your life easier. Um, <clears throat> so working on those projects, uh, once I inherited project number three, I was like, okay, I, I need a better way to write these tests because I'm constantly having to look back and forth between uh, pages, uh, between the different page objects, between the different tests, trying to figure out which uh, object I'm supposed to use, what classes am I supposed to use, what variables am I supposed to use. Um, some of my research came across the uh, fluent pattern. And the fluent pattern allows for very, very clean test methods. And I'll be showing one shortly here. Uh, but the fluent pattern consists of uh, two main 
terms, I guess. Two main patterns technically, but they go together. Uh, the first one is method chaining. And method chaining means that every method call that you make returns another object to use. So if you're using, if you're on a form like a really extensive like login, uh, really extensive login form, you get your name, date, date of birth, address. Uh, you would chain all of, all the calls together, so it would be <clears throat> each method will return the same class that it's in. So the the method would be uh, wow uh, fill in first name dot fill in last name dot fill in address dot fill in whatever. Um, don't worry, yeah, there's there's examples here. Um, <clears throat> The next one with the fluent pattern is method cascading. Uh, method cascading is when you return a new object. And this is when the method will create a new object and then return that object. And for automation engineers, you'll know exactly when those are go when those actions are going to occur. Because that's typically whenever you go to a new page. You're going to be needing to call new page objects. So what that looks like here is here's the uh, page for a home page. And there we have two methods, click on login button and click on about button. Uh, both of those methods return different objects. So here, this is returning the login page. And for the about button, it returns the about page. And all it's doing is clicking the well, either the login button or the whatever the about locator is. Uh, the about us page or contact us page and here it's the technically met method cascading uh, so return new about page so that's going to create the new object create a new about page object and then uh, send it to the method uh, what the login page looks like for the the test actually uh, here we have login with login with is the method passes in the username and the password, and it's going to just type in the username and type in the password, click the submit button, then it's gonna return the new admin page. So what that looks like in the full test is homepage.gotologin.login with username and password. And then we're just gonna do the assert statement down at the bottom. This is for just a very basic example. Uh, page title equals the driver title, essentially. So just make sure that it's on the correct page. And that is a fairly clean, it's a very clean, very simple test, uh, but it shows it off the method chain and method cascading very nicely. Um, you can hand this off to pretty much anyone involved with your product and they would know exactly what that test is doing. There's no ambiguity between what you're clicking on and everyone knows what the test is doing. The benefit for you is that when you go back and you have to like modify this test, because let's say you now have to click on a little menu button to actually uh, get to the login form, you can easily modify it. Um, and there's not a lot of code that you have to mess around with. And when you go to write new tests, not a lot of code you actually have to write. Uh, if you're using an IDE, which I highly recommend, the autocomplete feature of the IDE will be giving you suggestions of what are the methods in each class. So as you're typing this in, you would go, you'd be typing in home page dot, and then it would give you a list of the options, which above it was click on a login button or click on about button. And then you would select go to login and then the autocomplete will give you what are the methods available on the login page. So that one is in this example, it's login with, and then you just pass in the username and password. Um, <clears throat> and that makes it so much easier because you don't have to think about what pages you have to find. You don't have to look for what are the actual page names 
in your you don't think about the class names that are inside your uh, framework it's all there it's all built in it's all interconnected another benefit when you're actually using this with an ide is that the you can write out a very simple test on a new feature that's being developed and you can actually have the ide generate method stubs for all the methods that you have to uh, fill out uh, to make that test work so you can have the test you can write the test while developers are still building, building out the feature so that once the feature is done by the developers all you need to do is fill in the methods behind it how do you interact with this element how do you interact with this element and you're done because the test should be working at that point continuing on with fluence there's also a few packages called fluent assertions which i'll just cover here a little bit um, this is what nfluent looks like and that's a, a c sharp library and it's uh, check that and then it's all those method calls uh, make sure that the title contains dashboard in it uh, similar one for python is assert that home page go to login login with title is equal to dashboard those backslashes are just for readability of the python code within this little window um <clears throat> i've seen some people use them before however i'm not a big fan of those uh fluent assertions because to me they're not that easy to understand um because the whole all the steps of the test are built inside of the assertion and when you do that it makes it hard to distinguish what is it trying to get at for the test and if it's not easy to understand that means it's a confusion and i have to sit down and figure out what is this test trying to actually accomplish what are the pieces that are moving in it and if there's a lot of confusion i'm wasting a lot of valuable time and then i end up looking like this little robot here all confused all day long and i don't, I don't like that feeling I want to just sit down, write my test, or if I'm in debugging mode, go in there, look at it, know exactly where the issue is, and then fix it. Now, obviously, there's more than, there's more to testing a lot of current uh, systems under test today than just what's currently on the page, uh, such as database queries or API calls. So to handle those cleanly and easily, we're going to use some methods. <clears throat> and you'll, the best way I've found it is to have a class with like all the database queries or a class with all of the API calls, uh, typically broken down into the different segments. Uh, if it's like an API, uh, what are the different uh, routes of the API calls? And that's how I organize it. But then it all ends up going into one massive one at the end. And then inside the tests, you would call them in as needed. So <clears throat> for an, another example with C Sharp, here we're, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff lot of awesomeness in this uh, we have a new user with reuse equals true uh, set birthday equals January 1st 1980 dot build and then go ahead and log in with this user username and username dot password uh, go to settings and update the birth date with the user objects birth date <clears throat> And then the assertion call is just db.validate user. So the validate user will just be doing a little, <clears throat> will be doing a little uh, database query to get the user row and validate that all the records there are matching the what's in the user object here. And doing it that way, it abstracts away the 
database calls from the test itself. So you don't have ugly SQL polluting the test. <clears throat> and pretty much anyone can actually look at this test and uh, do it themselves. Um, now, if you're not using as complex data for your test, uh, like if you're testing different characters for username and passwords, I would recommend to use dictionaries. Um, and dictionaries are key value stores that are that have a really fast lookup time on them. Uh, if you were to have like a list to do a lookup in the list, you typically have to uh, go walk through the list, depending on which type of list you have. Uh, so a dictionary always has a very short a lookup time. And the best I found for any sort of validations is a dict consisting of a string for the key and an object as the value. What this does <clears throat> is that you can easily look for a key and then use it whenever you want to uh, just by getting the value of it. Uh, the value can be anything you want. It can be either a string or it can be a custom object like the user object before. And then within your tests, you never have to modify. You never have to do conversions or casting between different, different ones. You don't have to switch numbers to dates or strings to dates or the reverse. And the first time you do it, it's a totally over engineered solution. Um, and it's going to be the first over engineered solution for the first few ones you do. Uh, once you get past test like 300, um, it makes it very easy to debug your tests because you have a dictionary that has the values that are your, that you're using within this test. You can easily track and modify what is changing during your test. And you don't have to worry about the, you don't have to have different objects that are storing the data for different tests. So if you're having like a shopping cart area, you don't have, to have you don't have to pay attention exactly to which object of the shopping cart you're paying attention to, like user or what's actually in the cart or purchasing or checkout. <clears throat> and once you do all of that, you're essentially writing at that point your own domain specific language, especially if you make very customized methods on how you access the dictionary. <clears throat> By doing so, you're like automation engineer level three. Um, because then your tests are very easy to maintain for yourself. You can easily go into any test you want and see what's happening, update it, modify it, or even use it for different purposes. So uh, for one of the projects I actually had to consult on, it was um, essentially, I was brought in to help with the user aspect of it, test data essentially for the business users to use. And it was for uh, healthcare testing. So uh, I actually reused a whole bunch of scripts tied them all together so it would create tons of clients. It would create a bunch of different healthcare providers. It would create a bunch of different service centers. It would create a bunch of different uh, dependents, uh, or different groups, different families, different dependents, and all that <clears throat> fun stuff that's associated with very complex data testing uh, just by tying together a bunch of different tests that I already had written. and in about 30 minutes, it could come up with like, I think it was 800 users that could be used for business users to work with. Um, <clears throat> and that's all because everything was very modular. All the tests were very modularized and I could plug and play them wherever I needed them to. Uh, now going back to that previous example, there is this funny line here and it's the new user reuse equals true. Uh, technically, you don't need that reuse equals in uh, C-sharp. However, that's just for clarity. 
of what is actually happening here. Uh, set birth date dot build. So in this line, there's a few different items that we're implementing here. Um, <clears throat> this user is a local user for the test. That is declared in the base test because essentially any test you do is going to have a user object of some sort. So might as well just have it in the base test. I don't have to declare it in any test whatsoever. It's already there. It's already available for me. Uh, reuse equals true, uh, which is a con constructor level parameter. And what that's telling my framework to do is to grab an existing user. And it will just query the database and grab a random user to use. And the reason I do this, <clears throat> well, for me, my my whole view with computers is that, um, well, let me rewind there. Within the test, there's no reason to statically type in the users to use for a test in particular because computers can do it so much faster than us and have, they're more flexible and they follow exactly what you tell them to use. So if we were to use a statically typed user in it, if that user gets modified by another person without our knowledge, um, we might be creating a false positive because it now works for that user because it's been modified before. So new story time. There was a subset of clients that were supposed to get this brand new feature. And I was testing on a few of these clients and the tests were always working. When we go to implement it, I decided to check a few other clients that are supposed to have this brand new feature. And that's when uh, we learned that the developers hard coded in that these clients get this new feature. When it was supposed to be, if a prod, if a client has this specific product, then they should get access to the new feature. And because of that, I never wanted to ever statically type anything into my test if I don't have to, because computers are faster than us, and they can go through every iteration a whole lot faster than us. So. Like in theory, you can get, you know, 20% cover. If you have 100 tests and you run it 20 times, you would have run it with 20 different sets of parameters. Um, <clears throat> so you get a lot, a lot better coverage because you lower the overall risk because you've covered different scenarios every single time. A lot to unpack there. Um, and then it goes on to uh, set birth date equal to this value dot build. Uh, this is what's known as the uh, builder pattern. The builder pattern allows you to separate the construction of a very complex object from the representation. Uh, so essentially, you get to create create new objects with a very easy, very easily. If you were to do it statically, you would have to have. If you didn't follow the builder pattern for this and you wanted to modify like the birth date for uh, the user, you would have to uh, have empty parameters for every single, you'd have to have a parameter in the method for every parameter that's in the object and then modify the one that you want. And that's, I'm not gonna remember how many parameters there are in that. Uh, however, by having it as a builder pattern, it's a method to call dot set birth date to this new value dot build. Uh, now, obviously, you can modify that to have it just select a random date, and you can even make new custom methods that will select a random date uh, that fit a certain, certain criteria. So make sure the person's at least 18 years old, and then select a random date after that. <clears throat> uh, once you're using the builder pattern with creating complex objects for your test to consume and use, you're essentially automation engineer level four because you've gone above and beyond what most what most companies I've seen are actually doing with their frameworks. Um, 
Now, to take it a step further and prevent stuff from happening that I don't expect it to happen, uh, I upgraded my suite to actually start using generics. And I will concede that generics do look odd. However, <clears throat> they add in uh, compile time safety checks into it. So you cannot, by adding in compile time safety checks, I know that if you're trying to do something with the driver inside of the page object, um, that's a little weird, or you're mo modifying the test in a page, um, the generic itself will prevent you from doing it, and then you have to modify a whole lot of code to mess it up. And then you're, then you're actively trying to break the system at that point. Um, so here I have a uh, generic base page written in Java here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if I create a new page and I just pass in the URL and the title, it then gives me all these methods to it as well. So uh, navigate to this URL, uh, get the title, uh, validate the title as well, and then click on elements. Um, very clean, very simple. Um, that doesn't really showcase what it gets to do. Uh, but this is what one of the, these are, these are what some of the tests look like with it. Homepage dot validate title and it will just validate the title of the homepage, make sure it's correct. Homepage, click on the about page, validate title and the title page for the about page should have the word about in it. Ditto if I were to click on like tutorial link, whatever. Um, <clears throat> And you can't call those methods from other objects incorrectly. Um, that's mainly to enforce that certain methods are available in certain locations and other methods aren't. Um, at this point, you're like automation engineer level five uh, because you're making it actually difficult to use things in the in incorrect places. Um, Thus, you can have other people contribute code to it without a large risk of them messing it up or doing improper calls if you're not doing code reviews, which I highly recommend you should be doing code reviews. Um, <clears throat> and you might be asking, what are those funny steps if you look back at these? Uh, this step here, this page here, uh, step navigate to uh, parameter or step click on parameter. <clears throat> And that is the uh, Lura framework. Uh, the Lura framework is a, a test framework that was written by Yandex, which is a search engine popular in Russia or something like that. Um, <clears throat> the good thing, the, the one thing I really love about them is that it works across like all the main test frameworks. Because of that, it's the same implementation between different programming languages as well. And since I work in multiple languages on a daily basis, if I get to standardize what the test reports look like, I then can have similar code in, in the different projects. So in those examples, specifically what I'm doing are sub-steps and what that looks like within the report is um, that little plus button right there. If you can see there's an attachment there. And if you drill into it, it takes a screen. So it takes a screenshot on that page. So every time it navigates to a new page, it takes a screenshot. And then you can actually look at the screenshot in that report. Um, I also have it, which I don't show in this little example here, uh, but it actually takes a picture of the web element that it clicks on. That that takes a screenshot of the web element it clicks on that navigates to the page. So you can send this report out and this is actually ties into CI as well. So you can go from the CI dashboard for each build and uh, walk through every test in your 
test suite and see every last step that the test took and exactly which buttons did it click. And you can hand that off to anybody and they will know exactly what happened during the test at every single point in time. Uh, also makes it very clean and simple. Uh, if there's a bug, you can send this report to, you can send this whole log actually to a developer and they can easily see what all the action steps were, what it's looked like. How do I reproduce this bug? And when you make it so that you're, you don't have to describe what your test is testing to a developer or having to rewrite uh, how to recreate the bug in your bug, whatever bug tracking system you're using. And you can just attach a report and like show the developers that these are all the steps that occurred. This is how everything showed up and this is where it went wrong. Um, at this point, you're like an automation engineer level six because uh, you don't have to write super detailed bug reports because the report is already being made for you whenever you run your tests. So doing all of that, so <clears throat> putting it all together, if you follow dry principles, use the different, uh, fluent patterns with method chaining and method cascading, along with using generics and following the builder pattern, you can make really awesome, very easy to use and maintain test frameworks. And I have to tell you this and remind you is that we're all developers. So I definitely encourage you to keep growing your skill set with programming. As your skill set grows, your confidence will grow and you can do other cool stuff as well. Uh, this project is on GitHub. Uh, LazyCoder.io is a GitHub link and I'll make sure it's with the uh, presentation on Eurostar's site as well. Uh, I encourage you to follow me at LazyCoder.io or Twitter handle at LazyCoder.io. And if you liked what was in this presentation, and you want more content like this, uh, I actually have a Selenium package coming out soon in August, um, where it goes into how to do security testing, load testing, performance testing, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, everything related to Selenium and even more than that. Uh, that's very easy, clean, simple to plug in. And I think we're ready for some questions. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, I will take over presentation again. Thank you for that. Um, so there's still time to ask Andrew your questions. You can submit your question on the ch uh, question box on the right hand side of your screen. And I will get to them in just a moment. Um, we have two ebooks out at the moment. One is on Selenium. It's available to download on our Huddle site. And the next is Tech test techniques for the test analyst. So those two are available on our Huddle site to download now. Our program is out. We're getting ready for The Hague in November. You can check that program out on our Eurostar conference website. So um, Andrew, questions. Um, is abstraction a problem in small devices or constrained environments? Not really, because there's always going to be stuff that you're going to be constantly reusing. Um, even like, I mean, probably the lowest one would be like IoT devices. You might have some, you might run into some issues with abstraction. Okay. But besides, if you're not, if you're doing anything more complex than IoT devices, you you can you'll benefit from abstraction. Okay. What are the drawbacks of using singleton design pattern? Uh, what was? It? Can you repeat that? Yeah. What are the drawbacks of using a single a singleton design pattern? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, hmm. I I haven't really used it that much. Mm -hmm. um, but the only I the reason why I stayed away from it was because if I ever got somebody else to assist with the automation framework, they typically don't have a lot of automation skills or programming skills. 
So trying to introduce them to a singleton over uh, the fluent method would probably be a lot more complex. Okay. Um, someone asks here, what exactly is the difference between chaining and cascading? Uh, so chaining typically returns the exact same object that it's from. So that would be everything within a class would return the class again. So it would be uh, fill. So a sample would be fill in username uh, with whatever parameter it is. Uh, so it do a locator for that element, send in the keys for that element. And then instead of just returning void, which is what you would typically do, uh, you would return uh, the class again. So return this. The okay. method cascading is when you create a new object and you return that. OK. What happens if automated checks keep failing due to issues due to issues then genuine bugs and they keep and they keep raising false alarms so i suppose that's an automated question what what happens if automated checks keep failing due to uh, due to issues more than genuine bugs and they keep raising false alarms uh that means that the test itself is flaky and you need to look into how to make your test more stable uh the typical root cause for that is network issues mm -hmm. with your site um, and what I would recommend is figuring out which resources are going to take the longest to load and wait for those resources to load before continuing. Um, I also like to throw throw in, uh, whenever I navigate to a new page, I throw a small assertion in the constructor to make sure it lands on the page and the slowest element has loaded correctly before saying the constructor is done and we can use this page. Uh, doing that allows you to make sure you're on the page, everything is loaded, and you can proceed. If it fails, then it will show up in your test report, but that's not the purpose of the test, and you can easily just rerun those and see if that will uh, fix it, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, but you can keep track of what pages are the most sort of suspect to cause any problems. Okay. Sometimes my automated testing can take a long time to script depending on the complexity of the test. Is it sometimes quicker to manual test here? Um, in that one, that one particular day, yes, it will be faster to manually test it. However, if you're going to do it again, then you're going to lose a lot of time to do it. Um, and I, I had very long complex tests too, and that's why I followed. I started doing all these different things with the fluent and the method chaining um, because I didn't have a lot of time to sit around and figure out what I needed to use. And the IDE will auto complete the method calls for you so you can quickly write up new tests. Okay. With cascading, does that mean you don't have control about, about the updates and or deletes of the related records? Uh, repeat it again. I want with, to make sure I understand yeah. it. With cascading, does that mean you don't have control about the update deletes of the re related records? Uh, so I'm guessing if you were to uh, go to a new page, what I'm understanding is that if you go to a new, if you're creating a new object, a new page that you're navigating to, and there's less objects than you're anticipating. So I'm guessing like pagination or something like that. Okay. It, should, it shouldn't really matter because okay. if you can always return a new one itself. Okay. Um, and last question, but several of them, um, that cheat sheet and is it only available on Monday and do they sign up and they get the cheat sheet on Monday? Uh, yeah, if you fill in your the email address there, I'll be sending the link I'll be sending it out on uh, Monday. Uh, currently, the formatting is all weird and confused okay. and overlapping, so it's just I don't want to send it out now because it's an in, it's incomplete and needs to be just polished a little bit. So I'll just be sending that on Monday. I have other uh, meetings and such with Selenium Conference. Perfect. To get done, but that'll be Monday. Okay, perfect. And I can add that. Um, 
I can add that to the landing page here. So a recording of this webinar will be available over on the Huddle site on the same landing page where you registered and it should be up within an hour. So you can get the URL then to um, download Andrew's cheat sheet. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your time today. Um, great presentation. And you can be contacted over on Twitter. Your Twitter handle was um, at the beginning. So I can remind people again about that on the landing page. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Not have at all. Day, Thank you. Have a great day.